the idea yeah, is uh, knowing what is the distribution of the complex amplitude in this plane, which corresponds here yeah, with a well focal point, yeah, so but it just corresponds to the pupil plane. I would like to know yeah, what is the resulting distribution of the complex amplitude in the focal plane. Yeah. Now, would you agree that well at the point M I may represent yeah, the field of radiation, yeah? In the following way, I can say, okay, the field of radiation here yeah, is a complex amplitude. And since it is monochromatic, I know that it oscillates yeah, with the frequency nu. So yeah. Now the complex amplitude, yeah, I may rewrite it as follows. Well, it is equal yeah, to well, a real amplitude. Now multiply. This is a complex phase, yeah. N. Now I multiply it still by what I call the pupil function. Yeah. So the pupil function is equal to one if I'm inside the pupil, and it is equal to zero if I'm outside the pupil. Yeah. So very, very, very easy. Now we're following uh, the principle of, of Huygens Fresnel, yeah. I may, and, and well, simple laws of uh, geometric optics, I can say that, well, at this focal point here, in the focal plane, all the rays, yeah, which are converging, yeah, to that point, yeah, come before the optical lens system, yeah. So before, or on the left side, yeah. They all come parallel yeah, to this ray. Because this ray yeah, goes from H prime to N. And so come from a parallel direction here. And all those rays which will converge at N yeah, are parallel yeah, to this direction. Yeah? So I have represented there. Would you agree with that? Or is, it, is there any difficulty? So I, I just show it for a very thin lens. Yeah? So here is the focal plane. And if this defines yeah, the, the point that I've named N with the coordinates X prime, Y prime, I say the following. Uh, let's assume, so this is a focal plane, of course, yeah? Well, I know that This way, for the case of a s simple lens, yeah, is not deviated, yeah, because it goes through the center O. Here, it's a, more, a bit more complex because uh, the lens is more complex, and you have to refer to the two principal points, H prime and H. So this rays goes through H and remain parallel. And now I may say, okay, well, I if I would define here the pupil plane like that, yeah. Uh, necessarily, yeah, from a point M, the ray which goes here is parallel to this one. Goes like that. Well, from another point, it would be still parallel, yeah, and goes to here because I know that the parallel beam, yeah, converts yeah, into N. So very simple. Okay, so I may I pay, I may say now that at the point N. The contribution yeah, coming from the point M and uh, from a small surface area dx dy in the pupil plane will be what? Well, it will be axy multiplied by exponential of this i2p nu t and multiplied by this factor exponential i phi x where this accounts for well, a phase retardation. Now I take the convention, yeah? so it's just a, a matter of convention, that the ray passing via O okay, has a phase shift. So f for x equals 0, y equals 0, is equal to 0. So I take this as a reference. Yeah? So OK, 
but at the point m, this will not be equal to zero. Yeah. So how shall I find yeah, what is the phase shift between the ray coming from m and the ray coming from O? Well, it's very easy. Yeah. Uh, I take the projection of m along this direction. Yeah. So the projection of m is a point k. Yeah. So it means that the blue line that you see yeah, belongs to the same wave front. Okay, so the points M and K oscillate in phase. Yeah, so the phase retardation between M and O, well, is just due to this path difference. Yeah. Okay. Now I shall try to find out what is the value of this path difference. So I may say, okay, the phase x y is equal to two pi divided by lambda multiplied by delta where delta is equal to the difference between the distance, so I write it like that, distance m i n minus distance between O j n. So this is the path difference between the two rays. Yeah. So it's the difference between the distance yeah, of the ray going from m passing via i and going to n and the other one. Yeah. So the diagram will come again. How to evaluate yeah, uh, this uh, path difference? Well, I just need to make the scalar product of the vector on multiply by the unit vector along this direction. So I suppose that u yeah, has been normalized. And if you project yeah, OM yeah, on that direction, you will find exactly what the length of the path. Yeah? Now to make uh, this uh, scalar product, yeah, I know that the coordinates of OM well, are the following. I have a coordinate x, y, and 0. Yeah? Because I, I, I adopt yeah, this uh, system of coordinate x, y, and z. Yeah? So, the coordinates of m is in the plane x uh, is in the plane z equals zero. Yeah, so it's uh, x y zero. Now the coordinates of the vector u, which is a unit vector, yeah, is easy to deduce from the fact that this direction is parallel to that one. Yeah. Now, what is the distance between h prime and f prime? Yeah, it's f. It's the focal length. Now the coordinates of these points yeah, are the, therefore yeah, x prime, y prime, f. Okay. And now what I do, yeah, I divide everything by f, so I have x divided by f, x prime divided by f, y prime divided by f, and f divided by f it's one. Now <clears throat> I assume yeah, that the focal length yeah, is uh, significantly larger, longer than the module of x prime and y prime. It means that when I, I, I take the modulus yeah, of this uh, vector, what I find? I find that the module of u is equal to the square root of x prime over f square plus y prime over f square plus 1. Now, these are second order terms, yeah, because f is much bigger than x prime and bigger than y prime. So it goes away. And to first order, yeah, I may say, well, this is a unit vector. Okay. Now to make the, the scalar product of the two vectors, well, it's easy. I'm just uh, co-adding yeah, the product yeah, of all those coordinates. So it will be equal to x times x prime divided by f plus y times y prime divided by f plus 0 times 1. Yeah, so, so this is the result of the scalar product. So I may write here that the phase difference yeah, between the ray going from m to i j uh, n and o j n is equal to 2 pi divided by lambda times delta. But you know, this length is larger, it's longer than the other one. Yeah? So delta is a negative number. 
So I say, okay, minus 2 pi over lambda multiplied by x, x prime over f plus y, y prime divided by f. Okay? So finally, I find that the contribution yeah, to the amp amplitude of the electric field here due to the point M is equal to, well, it's A xy multiplied by exponentiation of minus 2 pi multiplied by x, x prime on lambda f plus y, y prime over lambda f multiplied by exponential of i to pi nu t. So the contribution to the amplitude, yeah? If it's due to a small surface element dx dy, well, I still have to multiply it by dx dy. Now, this I can take away and say, well, this is the contribution to the amplitude at the, at the point n. And now, well, do you agree that here at the point n, I receive contribution yeah, from all the points in the pupil plane. Yeah? So I have to integrate yeah, over all the points m in the pupil plane. So I integrate. This is what I obtain. So I obtain that, OK, the amplitude yeah, at the point n is equal to this quantity, which depends on the x prime over lambda f and y prime over lambda f, yeah? These are the only parameters, yeah, appearing in this expression. Otherwise, I integrate over the variable x and y, yeah? So now, I set the change of variables p equal x prime over lambda f, and q equal y prime over lambda f, and this expression becomes the resulting amplitude of the electric field in the focal plane is equal to the double integration of a x y times exponentiation of minus 2 pi multiplied by p x plus q y dx dy. And here I see that it's in a two-dimensional space of Fourier transform, yeah? So APQ, the distribution of complex amplitude in the focal plane, is equal to the Fourier transform of the distribution of complex amplitude in the pupil plane as a function yeah, of the new defined coordinates P and Q, yeah? So, so these are not x prime and y prime, yeah, but they are defined within a multiplic multiplicative yeah, factor. Yeah, the multiplicative factor being one over lambda f, one over lambda f. Yeah, and this, this is a yeah the fundamental theorem. Yeah, and a very, very nice result. Yeah, very very simple. So I remind you that the other well, important uh, theorem that we established yeah, was the following one, was that the visibility of the fringes, so it's something different, yeah, is equal to the module of the complex degree of mutual coherence. So it was zero UV. And this was also equal to the module of a Fourier transform of the distribution of the normalized intensity at the surface of celestial objects, yeah. UV and module. So I see, well, you know, the operations that we will well perform, yeah, in this case, yeah, are very similar to what we have already been doing, yeah. So Fourier transform, yeah, Fourier transform uh, is a recipe. So, any question, yeah, on uh, the establishment of this very important theorem? Because you will see it's a very powerful theorem, yeah, leading to extremely interesting results. Yeah. So, the demonstration, yeah, will be in the lecture notes. First application, yeah.
let's assume that we have a <coughs> XYZ that we have a square aperture as an entrance pupil yeah, of a converging system. Yeah? So it means that we have a mirror yeah, which is which has a square size or or a lens yeah, which has a square size shape yeah and so let's assume that this side is small a and this size is also small a and i'm looking yeah at the zenith yeah at a very distant star so where in the absence of atmospheric perturbations yeah this star emits plane wave fronts yeah and so the the plane wave fronts arrive here and after touch the pupil and because well, the pupil yeah, is a space coherent, yeah, well, I may assume that the distribution of a complex amplitude, yeah, in this case, yeah, is a constant. Yeah? Well, I, I can say, okay, the distribution of the complex amplitude in the pupil plane is a constant, and it is A0. Yeah? It's a real value. Yeah? Now, let's apply uh, this theorem. What? is the distribution of the complex amplitude in the focal plane yeah, of uh, an instrument, a telescope, yeah, which has a square shape. Well, it's the Fourier transform of A0 a as a function of PQ. OK, but A0, yeah, A0 yeah, can just go away yeah, from the Fourier transform. And here, what should I write? Well, the square aperture yeah, is the door function of x over a multiplied by the door function of y over a. Yeah? Now, we've seen already before that well, this can be shown yeah, to be equal to the Fourier transform of the door function x a, which depends on variable p because they have separation of variables, yeah? multiplied by the Fourier transform of the door function of y over a, which now depends on the variable q. This one, you remember, we applied the similarity property, yeah? and we found that, well, it was equal to a multiplied by the Fourier transform yeah, of the door function, yeah, but which depends on the variable a times p. So it will be the sink, so the sine cardinal of pi uh, of a p, a times p, like that, times a, the same, huh? times the sine cardinal of a times q. You agree? So it's equal to a square a square times so it is a sine of pi a p divided by pi a p multiplied by sine of pi a q divided by pi a q. Now we know that when we are making observations, yeah, we are what we are measuring is not the amplitude, but we are measuring the intensity distribution in the focal plane. So the intensity distribution in the focal plane, you remember, is equal to well, in fact, uh, the amplitude times its complex conjugate. But in this, in this case, yeah, everything is real. Yeah? So easy, it's equal to a p q, it's a power 2. So it will be equal to a to the power 4 times the sine of pi a p divided by pi a p square times the sine of pi 
aq divided by pi aq squared. And now I see I have a, a picture to show this result. It's here, yeah? So we see here, this is a square aperture and a wavefront, yeah, falling onto it, yeah? And now this is uh, the result, yeah, showing... Uh, Oh yeah, I forgot to, if it was A0, yeah, here I forgot the A0, A0, now the A0 square here, n times the A0 square here, and A0 square is what I call I0, yeah. Now, this is very interesting to, to see, yeah, that the intensity, yeah, the maximum intensity is obtained for P equals 0, Q equals 0, yeah, because sine X over X, yeah, the module is equal to 1. So the maximum amplitude is, is a to the 4. Yeah? Now, well, it, 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 it seems surprising because, you know, the surface yeah, of the pupil is a over square. Yeah? And here we see a dependence of a over the power 4. Does anyone know why? Well, we will see it in a moment. Yeah? Now, you see that we have this nice shape, sine cardinal, and then we have secondary maxima, yeah? And uh, we will see in a moment, yeah? We'll make the same application, yeah? For the case of a circular aperture, so a mirror, which is uh, circular symmetric, yeah? And well, it's something very similar, yeah? So it's what I said, yeah? When you do uh, calculations, yeah? Uh, about Fourier optics, it's very nice to take square apertures, square stars, you know? and because uh, the results are very simple, they are more complex, yeah, for the case of a circular symmetry, yeah. Okay, now what I would like, well, the angular resolution, yeah, of such a mirror, yeah, is determined, yeah, by the width, yeah, of this uh, first peak. You agree? So, the width, yeah, is the distance between the two minima on both sides, yeah. So, it's, it's the distance between this point and that point. So, let's try to find out what is this angular size. So, do you agree that the sine will be equal to zero if pi times a times p is equal to pi? Yeah? Because the sine, yeah, if this is equal to pi, well, this is zero, yeah? So it will be, uh, it will correspond to this minimum here. And if it is a minus pi, it will be here. So, okay, what I can write is that I will have zero whenever this is equal to plus or minus pi. So, I may divide by pi, and I find that in that case, p will be equal to plus or minus one over a. Yeah? Now, p, I remind you that p is equal to x prime divided by lambda f. So here I could write yeah, that delta p, so the width yeah, of the peak, is equal to 2 over a. Yeah? Yeah, because 1 over a minus minus 1 over a, it's 2 over a. So from this relation, I find that delta p is equal to delta x prime divided by f times 1 over lambda. And this is equal to 2 over a. Now, I concentrate yeah, on this result, and I may rewrite it in a different way. Delta x prime over f is equal to 2 lambda over a. And this, I may call it yeah, the angular resolution of the mirror. Yeah, why? Delta x prime yeah, is a separation between the two minima that I see from the center of the lens. Because at a distance f, yeah, the distance of the focal length. So it's an angle, yeah. It's it's angular resolution, yeah, of your mirror. So you you see that the angular resolution of a mirror here, it's two lambda over a, where a yeah is a side of, of the square. 
So smaller is the wavelength, better is angular resolution. Larger is the size of the mirror, better is angular resolution. Any question on this? Yes. Uh, you know that uh, the, from Rayleigh's criteria of resolution, the first minima of one star should follow the uh, central illumination of the second star. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In that case, that central illumination, central is UV00, and uh, first minima is the resolution. Okay, yeah, sure. And it's just twice of that. Yeah, sure. It's just a matter of convention to know what you are speaking about, yeah? So in this case, yeah, I decide to take the width between the two first minima, yeah? But I agree that uh, if we follow your criterion, yeah, it would be a different value. But I, I will adopt yeah, the same uh, criteria when referring to a circular aperture, and then you will see what is the difference, yeah? But I agree with you, yeah, sure. Okay, now, well, second application, yeah? Well, maybe not second application. I, I still stay here, x, y. So isolate the square aperture, like that, yeah? And now I assume, yeah, that I'm not looking at the star anymore in that direction, but in this direction. Okay? And now we could wonder, yeah, well, what, what, what happens, yeah, to the image that will be formed in the focal plane, yeah? Well, do you agree that in that case, uh, well, the, well, well, the main difference is the following, yeah, is that um, the plane wave, which will hit the pupil plane, yeah, will be slightly tilted, something like that, yeah? Which means that um, if here I have a zero phase difference, yeah, well, here I will have a positive delay, and here I will have a negative delay, yeah? Okay? So how to do that, yeah? So it, it is an interesting case. Well, I would like to go back to previous view of the optical converging lens yeah, here, yeah? Okay. So let's assume, yeah, so this is important, yeah, that I'm observing, yeah, well, a star in that direction. Yeah, okay, in that direction, yeah. So, the, the plane wave here yeah, will be perpendicular to the vector u, yeah? Okay, and now what, what, what I see, and I, I don't know if it's clear, but, so I have here the pupil plane. So the pu pupil plane is presented something like that. Now here I have the, the point O. Okay, so let's assume that I'm observing the star in that direction. Now I decide that the vector unit, yeah, which is along that direction as the following coordinates, I would say, okay, uh, B over F, C over F, and now here one. Now in the focal plane, I will go here to a point which coordinates yeah, are x prime equal b, c prime equal c, and of course uh, the z prime, yeah, the z prime is a focal length. Yeah. Yeah. So indeed, uh, yeah, it is a unit vector pointing in the direction of my of the star. Uh, now the plane wave, I, I don't know if I will be able to properly represent it, because now it, it it will be tilted. So the plane wave would be something like, yeah, something like that. I, I'm exaggerating a little bit, yeah, but just to see the, something like that, yeah. Now, if the point M, X, Y is here, what I see yeah, is that here the phase difference will be zero, but here the plane wave yeah, will take this additional path yeah, to reach M. Yeah? So now it will not be, uh, yes? It's a, it's a 
Excuse me? Plane of aperture. Yes. Yes. So this is a, the pupil plane is a plane of the aperture. And what I represented in blue, yeah, is a plane wave coming from the star. Yeah. So I, I see that there would be a delay, yeah? And so the delay, as before, yeah, uh, we found that delta was equal previously yeah, to it was x x prime over f plus y y prime over f with a minus sign. Now it's an opposite sign, so it will be plus. And now I replace x prime and y prime by b and c. So it will be b times x over f plus c times y over f. So this is very easy yeah, to, to find out. You need to concentrate yeah, at home yeah, and do the exercise yourself. You will, you will see that this is the expression. Yeah? So in that case, yeah, how should I change um, the expression yeah, of the Fourier transform? Well, it will be something like that. It will be APQ is equal to double integration yeah, of A0 times the exponentiation of, of i to pi multiplied by b times x over f plus c times y over f. And now for your transform, exponentiation yeah, of minus i to pi of x x prime over lambda f plus y y prime over lambda f. Okay, and here I've uh, I've forgotten. Uh, so it's two pi over lambda. Yeah. So here I write over lambda over lambda. So this accounts yeah for the phase uh, retardation yeah of the plane wave when it hits the point x y. Yeah, because well the star is not anymore yeah. At the zenith, so the plane wave does not coincide with the pupil plane, but it's tilted, yeah? So it's just geometrical, yeah? Okay, then dx dy, dx dy. So this would be equal to a0 times double integration of, I rewrite the things as follows, minus i to pi, multiplied by uh, here there will be x multiplied by p, then minus b over f lambda plus y multiplied by q minus c over f lambda dxy, dx dy. And this, I find that, oh, this is just uh, A0 times the Fourier transform of, well, the square aperture as before, yeah, as before. Yeah, because, well, I forgot to, I forgot to insert here pi x over A times pi y over A. So here, here also, I insert it, yeah? So it's a Fourier transform, yeah? Of x over a times y over a. Not for the variable p and q, but for the variable p minus b over lambda f. And for the variable q minus c over lambda f, like that. So what, what I find is exactly the same result as before, yeah? But instead yeah, of, being, of being centered at the value p equals zero, q equals zero, it has been translated, yeah? At the value p equal b over lambda f and q equal c over lambda f, yeah? Now, well, if I write, yeah, p equal b over lambda f, it's also writing that x prime over lambda f is equal to b over lambda f, which implies that x prime 
will be equal to b, and that y prime will be equal to c. Yeah, and it's exactly what I was expecting to get. Yeah, yeah. So if you are observing with a square aperture, yeah, a star, which is not at the zenith, yeah, what you will see in the focal plane, yeah, is still the point spread function, the response function of your your square aperture, yeah, but translate it. So there is invariance yeah, of the PSF in the field of view. So this is a demonstration, yeah, if you have a perfect optical system, there is invariant, it should be, there should be invariance of the point spread function in the field of view. Now if you have geometric aberrations or you know complication, optical complication, it will not be all, all, always the case, yeah. But this is uh, the result, yeah. So interesting. So the, the answer is that, well, this, instead of being here at p equals 0, k equals 0, will simply be translated. Yeah. So we still obtain the same result. OK. Now, next. Oh, yeah, next. Next. Uh, this is a. Uh, the problem of interest yeah, to us yeah, is that well, most of the telescopes yeah, do not consist of a square mirror, but a circular aperture, yeah, or spherical, well, spherically symmetric lens. Not spherically, but a circular symmetric lens. And uh, so now you see the aperture is represented by this model. And uh, what you will establish, you will see, it will go very fast, yeah. Because I will base uh, the results here yeah, on the demonstration we did last time concerning uh, uh, the free transform of a stellar disk, which is circular symmetric. So because it's exactly the same, yeah, yeah. And what we see is the results. This is interesting, yeah. Is that in the focal plane we should observe an airy disk, yeah, an airy disk. So how to? Establish that result, yeah, based upon the demonstrations that we did yesterday. The reminder: yesterday, yeah, we established that the visibility, which is a module of the complex degree of mutual coherence, for the case yeah, of well, a star which was represented by a circular disk. With a radius, yeah, you remember, rho, uniform disk, UD, like that. We found that it was equal to, well, the Fourier transform, yeah, of uh, the distribution of the complex degree of mutual coherence, yeah. So it was uh, the module, yeah, of the Fourier transform of the normalized intensity i prime zeta theta as a function of where we found the only parameters was r over lambda like that and we found the result yeah that it was equal to the module of two times the first order Bessel function yeah then it was two pi multiplied by rho of ud times r divided by lambda, everything divided by 2 pi rho ud r over lambda. So, yeah, so this was well, what we found, yeah? Now you remember, we were using here, yeah, the normalized, yeah, normalize intensity distribution at the surface of the star, yeah, which was, uh, you know, 1 over pi times the square of the angular radius. Now the problem, yeah, we should uh, solve now is to find what is the distribution of the complex amplitude in the focal plane, yeah? And we know that, well, it's equal to the module, yeah? So, Fourier transform here, the module of the Fourier transform. 
So of what? Of the distribution of the complex amplitude in the pupil plane, yeah? But wh what I would like to do, yeah? I know that it is constant, that it is circular symmetric, but I should normalize it, yeah? Now, if I normalize it, yeah, I should divide, do you agree, by the surface of the aperture, yeah? So I should divide by pi r square. So, okay, let's assume that I've divided by pi r square. Now, here, the coordinates I expect, yeah, would be something, uh, so p, it's x prime over lambda f, so p equal x prime over lambda f, q, it's y prime over lambda f. So I expect, you know, that this will correspond to something like small r divided by lambda f, r prime, where r prime, yeah, is a radial distance in the focal plane. So okay, I have right here, it will be, it will depend now on r prime over lambda f, like this. Now, I multiply, this is important, by pi r square. Yeah? Because, yeah? Here I normalize it, yeah? So here I denormalize it, okay? So what, what shall I find? Well, that it's equal to pi r square. Multiply by what? By the, something similar to that, yeah? So it will be twice the value of the first order Bessel function of 2 pi is 2 pi. Rho ud. What, what shall I set for rho ud? Here. What? Well, no, I will put a big R, which is the radius of the mirror, yeah? This was the angular radius of the star, so this is the, the radius of the mirror, okay? Now the r over lambda should be r prime over lambda f. So I write r prime over lambda f, like that. And then I divide by the same quantity, 2 pi r time r prime over lambda f. And I take the module. See? You agree with that or not? <laughs> well, it, it's just, uh, you know, you have to find uh, the corresponding change of variables, yeah? But it's trivial. One has to concentrate, and uh, it's, it's not difficult, yeah? OK, now, well, IPQ, the intensity, yeah? Well, only depends on uh, R prime, in fact, yeah? So the intensity. As a function of r prime is equal to what? Well, I have to take uh, the square of that expression, yeah? So it will be pi times r square at the power 2 multiplied by 2 times the first order Bessel function times 2 pi r times uh, r prime over lambda f divided by 2 pi r, r prime over lambda f. Take the module, no, I take square, yeah. And in principle, yeah, this should be the illustration of that quantity that you see here, yeah. Now, well, let's see if it makes sense, yeah. You remember that uh, the first order Bessel function will have a zero for the value of the argument equal to 3.8, yeah? So here I just write, okay, 2 pi times r times r prime over lambda f should be equal to 3.8. Okay, I divide by pi, 3.14. Well, 2 times r is a diameter, yeah? So I divide by the diameter, okay? And now I multiply by the wavelengths. So I find that R prime over F is equal to 3.8 divided by 3.14, it is 1.22. So 
lambda over d. Now, the distance between the two minima, yeah, will be twice that value, yeah? Okay, so I have to multiply this by two, and this by two, and I find now that, well, the angular resolution, yeah, of a circular symmetric disk is equal to two times r prime over f, which is equal to 2.44, Lambda over D. Yeah. So the width yeah, the basis yeah of this peak yeah is a two point forty four lambda over D. Before, yeah, what we were finding, you remember for the square aperture, we were finding that the angular resolution of a mirror which is square and which has a size of small a is equal to two times lambda over D. Uh, over a, yeah, it was a was a side, yeah, of the of the mirror. And now well, there is a, an interesting uh, philosophical question, yeah. If I give you yeah a square aperture, and if I give you a circular aperture, which area are the same? Yes, yeah, so the surface are the same. Which one is the most resolving? What would you select? The square one or the circular one? Well, to find out, yeah, you have to do the small calculation at home. Yeah? So you assume that uh, pi times r square is equal to a square. So the two pupils have the same surface. And then you try to find out which one is the most resolving. Yeah? I know the answer, yeah, but I keep it secret. secret. Till tomorrow. <laughs> Who among you, yeah, already made that demonstration, yeah, well, so roughly with the first order Bessel function to find the expression of the airy disk, yeah? Because very, very often, yeah, at high school or even in the university, yeah, the professor of, of optics, yeah, tells you, well, this is the airy disk, yeah, this is the expression, yeah. Did, well, did you see the demonstration before or not? No, no. But you see, it's very simple. Yeah? It's just Fourier optics, yeah? Just Fourier transform, yeah? And uh, the complication is that when you use square or rectangular aperture, everything is simple. It's sync function. When you use a circular symmetry, whoa, zero order for order Bessel functions, yeah? But it's okay. So I think that we did a lot, yeah, already, and maybe it's a good time to break, yeah? 15 minutes, yeah? to refresh <laughs> our memories, yeah. So if you have any question, yeah, don't hesitate. This will be interesting. We will address the case, yeah, of uh, two square apertures, or I would say, no, of two apertures, yeah, but two identical apertures, yeah. So the two apertures could be either square, rectangular, triangular, ba ba banana shape, or circular. And we will find, you know, when uh, we are we're letting the light interfering, yeah, what will be the response fu function? So this is the interferometer, yeah? So after the break, yeah, we will address that issue.